Bitcoin's price is pumping. So should you buy now or should you wait? Well, you already know that the banks are failing, interest rates are rising, the Fed is easing, and of course, like I said, Bitcoin is pumping. So what is going on in the economy? What's happening with the Fed? And of course, what the heck is up with Bitcoin? If you haven't noticed, Bitcoin's up 80% on the year. It's also up 20% just on the month. And now, of course, I'm getting all kinds of messages of people asking me why it's pumping. And of course, should they go all in right now? So in this video, I'm gonna break down what's going on with the banks, the Fed, and of course, with Bitcoin, so you can understand why it's going up and if you should buy now or wait for a better price. So much to dig into, so let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss and I make these videos to change the way you think about money because almost everything you've learned is wrong. And I get it, it's confusing. It's hard to know what to think because you're getting so much different information. And so rather than give you just my opinion, I wanna teach you how to think through this because we're all gonna make it. We're gonna get it, we're gonna make it if we play this right. So let's dig in here. All right, so Bitcoin. I like to talk about Bitcoin. A lot of you don't like to hear me talk about Bitcoin. Doesn't really matter. You can't ignore the fact that Bitcoin is up 80%, 80% just this year, 2023. It's up 20% just this month. What the heck is going on? You better be paying attention, so let's dig in. Now, of course, you already know, I've been talking about, I've done several videos about the banking crisis. We know that the banks are failing. Of course, I've been talking about this for a long time. Of course, we knew the banks were going to fail. I've made videos about um, the FDIC and how they're not going to be able to have enough money to back up your um, accounts. I've been talking about the damage and the problems that the banks are in. And of course, here we are, the bank failures. Like I said, I've talked about it. We saw Silvergate go down. Then we saw Silicon Valley Bank, SVB, go down. Then we saw the um, feds and FDIC take down Signature Bank. Of course, now the giant global bank, Credit Suisse, which we've been talking about for well over a year, failed. We have First Republic um, Bank that's on the brink. And so we're seeing these banking crises happening all over. Something else that I've been talking about was uh, this choke point 2.0. I did a video. We'll go ahead and link that up here. We'll put it in the show notes. Watch it after we're done here. Choke point 2.0. We talked about how the Fed was going to try to choke off um, all the exits. So uh, the ship that you're on is going down and they want to block off the exit so you can't get into the life rafts. And we talked about how they use choke point uh, 1.0 and what ch ch choke point 2.0 is. And so go back and watch that video. We'll link to it down below. But that's kind of what we're seeing. We're, we're seeing is that these crypto adjacent banks, these banks that have been friendly to cryptocurrency, which of course is a way to get out of the financial system, a parallel system, if you will. And they've been taking these down. Now, these banks don't just go down on their own. Typically, there's some sort of catalyst. And so it's just coincidental these happen to be crypto adjacent banks. So we saw Silicon Valley Bank. Of course, they were you know, financing primarily tech, right? Venture capital in Silicon Valley, a lot of crypto firms. We saw Silvergate Bank, which was the largest crypto adjacent bank. That's the first one that went down. We saw then Signature Bank, which was the second largest crypto adjacent bank. Now, what's interesting about that one is per um, Barney Frank, who is one of the authors of the Dodd-Frank bill, um, they, they authored that after 2008 to save the banks. He said that he doesn't understand why that bank went down. Lots of people are saying they don't understand why Signature Bank was taken down. They seem to be solvent at the time of the FDIC closure. So was it sort of like in the fog of war? Let's go ahead and just shut all these crypto adjacent banks down. Maybe, maybe not. It doesn't really matter. Let's dig more into the facts. All right, so as I said, Bitcoin has been rallying at the same time that we've been seeing the banks failing. So what's going on? Well, a few things that we do know is that, um, as I've been talking about extensively, the central bank, the Fed, has been on the warpath, raising rates at the fastest rate in history. They said they're gonna raise rates until something breaks, and of course, now they have. The Fed is now broke. The U.S. government, the Treasury is now broke, and now the banks are failing. And so basically, they've just been continuing to raise rates, raise rates, raise rates. And here we are, the time of this recording, the Fed decided to raise rates again another quarter point. But it looks like, based off of what they said at the meeting, what Jerome Powell said afterwards, and more importantly, looking at the betting markets, the Fed fund futures, and they are pricing in no more rate hikes in the this year. And as a matter of fact, they're actually pricing in a 75 basis point cut before the end of the year. Now that's a pivot, right? They've been raising rates. A pause would be no more raising rates, which is where the markets say we are right now. No more raising rates. So now we're at a pause, which historically has been really good for risk assets. And then they're pricing in a cut of 75 basis points by the end of the year. And so of course, risk assets are rallying. 
Now we've seen the Fed, they've also started to inject liquidity. Of course they have to. The banks are collapsing. Now, that's what the Fed really cares about. When they said that they're going to raise rates until something breaks, I would always say, what is that something that breaks? Well, it's when the liquidity dries up. And so liquidity dried up, the banks are failing, the Fed has to start injecting liquidity, and they're expanding the balance sheet. And of course, when they expand the money supply, when they expand the balance sheet, risk does really, really well, which of course, which is why Bitcoin is surging so much. Now, I do just want to say, of course, I talk about Bitcoin a lot. If we go back to July of last year, July 13th, I did a video when Bitcoin was at 19,000 saying, I think this was going to be about the bottom. I did another video in uh, November, uh, November 22nd, when Bitcoin was 16,000 saying, I think this is probably the bottom. Uh, January 2016, talking about how the pivot was now in, how they changed the CPI calculation. And so, You've had a couple chances to get in, and yet here we are, it's pumping. Now, let's talk about why. Let's talk about the mechanics of this, right? Let's look at the facts. So basically, as I said, liquidity is on the rise. We have the expanding balance sheet. So basically, the Fed has come up with a couple magic tricks, if we call it that. So they come up with a um, these emergency liquidity facilities. Uh, the first one, this new one, is called a Bank Term Funding Program, or BTFP. It's almost like by the uh, effing dip. <laughs> it's like one letter off. So that's a new facility that they have. And so basically what they said is, hey, the banks, you're holding all these risky assets, which are U.S. treasuries. Um, what we'll do is we'll take those as collateral and give you more money. And we'll give, them, we'll give you the value of the face of that, not the amount that it's um, discounted to. Um, in addition, they've opened up this discount window for borrowing. It's been used before. It's not brand new. But we're seeing banks tap into this big time. As a matter of fact, we haven't seen banks tap into this discount window for borrowing this much since the 2008 financial crash. And of course, now we're also seeing emergency central bank US dollar liquidity swaps, where there's trading money back and forth to keep the liquidity, to keep the money in the system going. And all of this equals easing, an easing monetary policy. This equals balance sheet expansion. It equals more bank reserves. Now, you're gonna hear people on YouTube and on Twitter telling you that this is not um, easing, that this is not expansion, that this is not inflationary. And I would say that they maybe are technically correct, but intellectually dishonest. And what do I mean by that? Well, when they give the money to the banks, it doesn't necessarily increase the money supply per se, because they're just taking one asset and giving them another. Okay. So technically they're kind of right. However, they're, they're intellectually dishonest because what happens is when the Fed comes in and backstops the bank, when they take bad assets and give them new assets, that frees the bank up to now go expand the money supply, right? The bank would be restricted if they were losing money, if they were sitting on losses, if they didn't have the ability to create new money. But when they take the bad, the toxic assets off and give them new assets, that creates the expansion of the money supply. One, the bank will do more loans. Two, you and I feel better about the economy, so we'll go borrow more money. Remember, the monetary supply expands through debt. We know that now they're bank, they're backstopping deposits. We know that they're going to backstop the bank, so we feel better about going and spending money, buying the house, buying the car. And so while the action itself specifically, technically, maybe doesn't expand the money supply, the act of it itself does. And so I want you to kind of understand that nuance. And so we're seeing these bank reserves go up. We're seeing the balance sheet expand. And like I said, we're seeing risk assets appreciate as these bank reserves rise. Now, the bigger thing that we have going on, and this is something I've been talking about, I really started hammering when the truckers protest in Canada got shut down. I really then pounded the table when Russia had its bank account seized. And what we're really witnessing is a loss of trust. You've heard me talk about this a lot. It takes a lifetime to build up a reputation of trust. It takes one time to ruin it. And what we're witnessing is a loss of trust in banking. The Canadian truckers found out that their money in the bank wasn't theirs. They could lose it at any time. Uh, Russia, one of three global superpowers with nuclear weapons found out that their money in the bank wasn't safe. And now the whole world is waking up to the fact that even in the United States, money in the bank isn't necessarily safe. Now, in this specific case, they've agreed to backstop the deposits of Silicon Valley Bank. Of course they did because, you know, these are the venture capitalists from California, the Democrats that are the big campaign donors. Of course, Gavin Newsom, Governor Gavin Newsom of California had his bank accounts there. So of course they bailed that out. But Janet Yellen, the head of the treasury, under testimony from, I believe, the senator from Oklahoma said, what, what is the criteria for choosing banks to save and not save? And she says, well, you know, me and the president, we're just going to talk about it. He says, so you're just going to talk about it? But what's the qualification, the criteria? She said, well, we don't have any criteria. It's just, you know, we're going to talk about it. 
So basically, they're picking and choosing winners. They're king-making. Now, if it was a bank that handled oil and gas or farmers in Midwest, probably would have been a little bit different, but that's where we are. However, what they're saying right now, Janet Yellen at the Treasury and the government are saying that they are working on a way to find out how the Fed can guarantee all the deposits in the banking system. It's about $18 trillion. Now, to put this into comparison, remember when the global financial crash happened in 2008, the banking crisis happened, the Fed had to step in with $700 billion, $700 billion. Now they're talking about $18 trillion. How do they do that? Where does $18 trillion come from? What happens if they have to backstop $18 trillion? Well, if you guessed massive inflation, then you would be right. You, if you guessed destroying the currency, then yes, you would be right. But more importantly, like I said, the loss of trust in banking. People are starting to realize that inflation is both permanent and intentional. This is what the father of Austrian economics, Ludwig von Mises, framed up as the crack up boom. He said, and then suddenly people realize that inflation is both permanent and intentional. So the Fed tells us our goal is to have 2% inflation. It's permanent. It's intentional and it's not going down. They've been trying to get inflation to come down and it's not. And then the second part of the crack up boom is then they realize they don't want to hold money and they'll exchange it as fast as they can for anything else, which is exactly what we're seeing. And so people are fleeing the banking system and looking for other financial tools, such as high yielding treasuries. So why would I keep my money in, in the risky bank and make 0.8% when I could just go park it in treasuries and earn 4% or 5%? Why would I keep it in the bank making 0.8% when I could move it into money market funds or six month CDs in my brokerage account? Why would I hold uh, cash that's risky uh, when I could just move it into gold that's moving up really fast or move it into Bitcoin, which is exactly what's happening. People are realizing they don't want the counterparty risk of having the money in the bank and they're moving it directly to the treasuries instead, money market funds, CDs, Bitcoin, and gold. As a matter of fact, we saw this happen in the fastest pace in history. As a matter of fact, uh, the treasury came out, I saw just earlier today, and they were saying, we had no idea. We were completely caught off guard. We never would have imagined that this much money could move this fast. <laughs> well, welcome to the digital age, when one tweet can be shown to millions of people, and I can open my app, and with a click of a button, I can move my money. As a matter of fact, Silicon Valley Bank saw over $42 billion moved in a single day. All right, now back to Bitcoin. So who the heck is buying this pump? Why is it going up so fast? 80% this year, 20% this month. Why is it going up so fast? Who's buying? Is it sustainable? You can see I have a chart on the screen and this shows the difference of the small players, which we would designate as 10 Bitcoin or less. And then you can see the institutional buyers that are 10,000 or more Bitcoin. Quite a big difference. And what you can see is that the small players are way outpacing the large institutions. Now, of course, the large institutions buy more, but what we're seeing is a more even distribution. I know a lot of people that don't like Bitcoin say it's unfair. You know, all these big guys, they gobbled up the, all the Bitcoin. But what we're seeing is that the small accounts, less than 10 Bitcoin, are way outpacing the Bitcoin adoption. So while we are seeing institutional buyers, as you can see from the chart, we're also seeing massive retail demand. And what I like about this is because it's much more more sustainable. It's much more decentralized. It's more, much more diversified. What we can also see from the chart that I have up on the screen is that all of the Bitcoin, you buy it on exchange, you exchange your dollars for Bitcoin or other crypto for Bitcoin. What we can see is that the Bitcoin is flowing off of the exchanges. People are pulling it off the exchange, which you should. Don't leave your Bitcoin on exchange, not your keys, not your coin. You leave it there, it could disappear. And what we've seen is the largest 30-day outflow of Bitcoin off of exchanges ever. So not only are people losing trust in the bank, they don't want their money in the bank, so they're moving to Bitcoin, they don't want to trust their Bitcoin on exchanges either, and they're pulling off the largest outflow um, ever. We see that there's only 12% of the existing Bitcoin supply left on exchanges today. So that means uh, the, uh, the rest of it has been pulled off, what is that, 88% has been pulled off and moved into cold storage. That means it's not likely to go back on the exchange. Remember, really simply, I always say this, markets stop going up when there's no more buyers and markets stop going down when there's no more sellers. So if 88% of all the Bitcoin has been pulled off of exchanges and put away in cold storage, that means it's probably not gonna be sold anytime soon market stop going out and there's no more sellers. So that's an important thing to watch. Now, with only 12% of the available supply on exchanges to buy and sell, it created a massive supply shock. 
Price moves on supply and demand. More demand and not enough supply. Of course, there's also a mistrust, not just in the banks, but also on these centralized crypto exchanges, as there should be. Of course, <laughs> the fall of Celsius, BlockFi, uh, FTX, et cetera, should show you that you should not trust the banks, nor should you trust these crypto exchanges. Now, a couple ways that we can also look at the price of the Bitcoin. Is this sustainable? So it's decentralized, supply and demand imbalance. People have pulled the Bitcoin off the exchange and put it away in cold storage. There's some other ways we can look at it. And so we look at something called the Bitcoin fair value framework. Uh, this chart that we have up on the screen is, is from my friends over at the Bitcoin layer, Joe Consorti and Nick Badia. We'll put a link down in the description if you want to check them out. But what we can look at a couple things. So one, we look at on-chain data. So Bitcoin is different than any other financial asset. If I'm looking at um, oil or natural gas, or I'm looking at, you know, whatever, um, I can't see all the data. So Bitcoin is an open source network, so I can see the coins, I can see the last time they moved and stuff like that. And so what we can see is we can see the on-chain data, the price floor. And basically what this is, is the realized price. We can see um, the time when all the Bitcoins moved and what the average price was at the last time it moved. And so we basically try to extrapolate um, what the um, cost basis is for that Bitcoin. And what we can see is it's about 19,900. That's about the price floor. So uh, it would have to fall bef below that before people are starting to lose money. Another um, metric we can look at to develop this fair value framework is the technical price floor. So we'd use something called the 200 week moving average. It really smooths out the moves. Of course, I've been talking about these for months. I've shown you these charts. If we look at the 200 week moving average, we can see that the price for that, the price floor is 25,372. So right about there. And then finally, we like to look at the production cost. Just like gold, there's a cost to bring that gold out of the ground. With Bitcoin, it's the same thing. There's a cost to bring the Bitcoin out of the ground or out of the computer. And so we have to basically um, plug in the machine. We have uh, electricity expense and so forth. And what we can see is the price floor or the cost to mine a Bitcoin is about $30,000. And so when you add that up, it kind of gives us this um, fair value framework range that we're in. Now, we can also look at, like I said, I've said many times, um, professional investors don't ask themselves, is it the bottom or the top? Now, I told you that I've been talking about Bitcoin. I named three or four different videos that I've given, and I said I think it's around the bottom. Nobody knows the bottom or the top of a market. Anyone that says they do is a liar because nobody can know that. If you knew the top or the bottom, you'd be the richest guy in the history of the world, and of course you don't. What we do is we want to know when things are cheap or when things are expensive. All right. And so we want to look at these um, value pricing and go, is it below that? Okay, it's a cheap opportunity. So I've made several videos talking about that. And what we can see is that Bitcoin has been under its fair value. It's been cheap. It was cheap for 229 days straight. Now, as I always said, it's cheap. It's historically cheap. It's a historic buying moment. It doesn't mean it can't get cheaper, and it doesn't mean it can't stay cheap for a long time. And so it did. It stayed cheap for 229 days. You had your chance to buy a historic buying um, opportunity, and it's not anymore. As a matter of fact, now it's up over that. What we can see is that uh, it's up about, uh, about a $25,000 price range is sort of that fair value. We're a little bit over that, but you still have a chance to get in about... <laughs> at the fair value, about a historic buying opportunity, a little bit past that. Um, but more importantly, the big picture shows us that institutions and retail buyers are scooping up as much cheap Bitcoin as they can. Hopefully you got some, leave me a comment, let me know. But also what we're seeing is the macro environment is very, very favorable. Everybody wants to get their money out of the banks. The banks are failing. The Fed is easing massive liquidity injections, and so Bitcoin loves that. Now, one of the other catalysts that we have looking at Bitcoin is the halving cycle. So every four years, the amount of new Bitcoin gets cut in half. It halves, all right? Now, we know that the halving cycle is, in, is next year, in 2024. And what we can see is that the Bitcoin supply schedule, uh, like I said, gets cut, and that happens next April, about a year from now. And right now, we're seeing about 6.25 Bitcoin being released, 6.25 new Bitcoin being released every single block, about every 10 minutes. And when that gets cut in half next April, that goes from 6.25 down to 3.125 Bitcoin. Now, again, price moves on supply and demand. So if you have the same demand and you reduce the supply by half, what do you think happens to the price? If you guessed up, you'd be right. Now that's assuming that the demand stays the same. What if the demand goes up? What if more banks are failing? What if more Fed, what if more central bank easing is happening? What if more authoritarian governments around the world are seizing people's money? What if the demand goes up and the supply gets cut in half?
What happens? The price goes up even faster. You got that. Now, you can see I have a chart up on the screen right here, and it shows that um, – you can see these halving cycles and where we are on the screen right now is in the dip right before we start to get the next pump. Now, as they say, as we say in investing, uh, past performance is no guarantee of future performance. However, what we can see is that it's been pretty predictable and it looks like that's where we're at right now. And so if we look at it from the halving cycle perspective, it looks like this pump is here to stay. Now, all of the things that are going on here, the failing banks, the Fed pumping liquidity, um, and, and so forth, is a perfect setup for rocket fuel to push risk on assets like Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin, as I've broken down in many other videos, it, it sniffs out these moves in advance. It's very sensitive to liquidity in the system. And what we can see is that the expectation that Fed hikes are over from here, we've seen that they have now a Fed pause. That's what they're projecting. And of course, like I said, historically, a pause has been very good. Risk assets rally really, really hard. We see that the Fed is reliquifying banks. So all these banks that were going bankrupt, they've reliquified them. They've expanded their balance sheet. We're seeing more bank reserves, which of course makes risk assets rally again. And what we're seeing overall, and this is the big trend that continues to build and build and build is that faith is being lost. Trust is being lost in traditional financial institutions. And I think this contributes to basically a lot of the inflow that we're seeing near term. All right. But cycle after cycle, more and more people are being drawn into Bitcoin. So more people are being aware of it. More people are seeing how it responds to this and more people are being drawn to this as it comes in. So where are we at? Should you buy Bitcoin now or should you wait? Well, let's break this down. So a couple things. First of all, if you're looking at any investment, I don't care what the asset is, any investment, and you're looking at it on a weekly or a monthly or a quarterly basis, you're never going to make it. So what happens is, you know, who knows? Bitcoin might pull back from 28,000 to 24,000 and people are going to leave comments. Ah, oh, Mark, you're wrong. You're wrong. It's like, come on. If you're looking at your assets on a weekly or monthly basis, like you're never going to make it. All right. You need to zoom out and look at the big picture. So ask yourself this question. Do you think that the governments and the banks magically become unbankrupt? Do you think that the Fed, that uh, the government that can't even afford the interest on the debt and has to print money just to stay up with the interest, do you think they're going to stop printing money? Do you think there will be more money printing in the future? Do you think that governments will magically become less authoritarian and give you back more freedom? around the world, not just the United States, but around the world. You think North Korea is going to give that up and Lebanon and Turkey? You think that? So what do you think is going to happen? Well, my guess is that they become more authoritarian. I guess that they're going to continue to print more money. And I guess that Bitcoin supply is going to go down as the demand is going to go up and the price is going to continue going up. You can buy it at about historic buying opportunities still today. Now, for the strategy, should you just YOLO in and put all your life savings in? Or should you use another method, which we call DCA dollar cost average in? So dollar cost average is basically say, let's say that you want to put $10,000 into Bitcoin. You could YOLO in and put all $10,000 in today, call that lump sum. And maybe you get lucky and maybe this is the best point to buy, but maybe you're afraid it may drop. I heard on someone on YouTube that it's going to drop to $12,000. So what you can do is, um, what percentage chance do you think it has of going to 12%, 12,000? Is there a 50% chance, an 80% chance, a 10% chance? So then put that much money into Bitcoin. So if I think it's a 50% chance it's still going to drop, then I would put 50% of my portfolio or my, my um, position into Bitcoin today. And then I could continue to dollar cost average in if it drops down lower. Now, if it doesn't, and it just continues to go up from here, then I'll just continue to dollar cost average up. And I end up with a higher cost average of Bitcoin as opposed to if I would have lump summed average in, but that's the way that you play it. So lump sum in, dollar cost average in, either way, I would say to get in. Now, a lot of people ask me what percentage of your portfolio, and that's a personal question. I can't answer it for you. What I can say is historically, in investing, the rule of thumb is never invest more than 5% of your portfolio in any one allocation. So never more than 5%. So a 5% allocation would be totally reasonable. One, two, three, 4%, 5%, totally reasonable. If you uh, a big believer like me, then you can put way more in, but that's up to you to decide. But I think why not take at least a one or 2%. If you lose one or 2% of your portfolio, it's not going to make a difference. If this does what we think it can do, it can make a massive difference. But I would like to hear what you have to say. What do you think? Is this for real? Is now the time to buy? And are you going to YOLO lump sum in or are you going to dollar cost average? Leave me a comment. Let me know. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. If you don't, you can give me a thumbs down. That's okay. But at least tell me why in the comments down below. And that's what I got. All right. To your success.